Good morning, church. Today's reading is from Hosea chapter 14. Uh, We're going to be reading 1 through 9, which is the whole chapter. So starting in verse 1. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with your words and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity except what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, and we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you the orphan finds mercy. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like the evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise... Let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? That's what I like to hear. Happy Sunday. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, For those of you on YouTube Live joining us, we're glad to have you here, including my wife at home with a sick kid. Try to make it through the whole sermon, please, without taking care of all the coughing and other symptoms. If I haven't met you, my name is Jace. I'm the youth pastor here at Desert Breeze. Uh, It has been uh, a pleasure being on staff. In just a few weeks, it'll be three years and I am loving every minute of it, loving on our teens, and look forward to uh, the future and how that continues. Uh, I want to wish you a belated happy Thanksgiving. I trust you spent a lot of time with family. I trust you ate a ton of good food, uh, watched some halfway decent football games, and fell asleep on the couch afterwards. That's fine. Uh, But ultimately, I, I... I hope you just took the time to, to share with your family and, and talk about what you're thankful for and, and make the most of the opportunity that we get to spend with family and friends. I've got some good news and I've got some bad news right now. I'll say them both at the same time. Our study on Hosea ends this weekend right here. So I don't know if those are happy laughs or... We just wish there were more laughs. No, it is the final weekend of seeing that big, nasty red word in the bumper uh, show up there. And then, of course, the Baptist in me goes, you can't say that word in church. You're reading out of the wrong translation, of course. Uh, So, no, we don't have to see that, and we don't get to go through Hosea next week. And next weekend, we start a new series, Marching Toward the Birth of Jesus. I do want to say, though, it is a rare thing for a church to go through the entire book of Hosea. So, in fact, let's give Pastor Ray a big round of applause for having the courage to go through 14 chapters. Uh, I did, as I was doing some studying and and, and looking at different resources and materials, I I was looking around for other churches that have done the full 14 chapters. And for the most part, you'll see a church that does chapters one, two, and three. And then week four is just chapters four through 14. And just kind of wipe that out real quick because it's a hard read. It's a hard book to go through. Uh, It's hard to understand sometimes, but I just love that every chapter and in every verse we have example after example after example of God's persistent love for us the love that we don't deserve and we so willingly go against all the time but he continues to call us when you do read the first three chapters of Hosea I will say there is something kind of catchy about the story there's something kind of thought-provoking about the story about how how God instructs a prophet to marry a prostitute, knowing full well that this prostitute will cheat on him, will leave him, will abandon their children. And you just look at that and go, wow, this is just a terrible beginning to a story here. But instead of ending the story right there, 
God then instructs Hosea to go and redeem that same prostitute, to buy her out of that life so that she can be saved. A lot of us get to the end of chapter 3 of Hosea and we go, wow, thank you, God, that I am not like Gomer. Thank you that she is so bad and I can learn from how bad she is. She is so deep in her sin. She is so lost. Thank you that I'm not as bad as that. And for whatever reason, when I have thoughts like that and I think about Gomer like that, I think to an interaction earlier in the Old Testament or earlier that we read in the Old Testament where the prophet Nathan has an interaction with King David and he's calling King David out on some sin in his life. And he tells this story. He says, there was once a rich man who had everything and he took from a poor man his one and only lamb. And as David hears that story, he gets angry. And he says, let's go find that rich guy and let's give him the punishment that he deserves. But the prophet Nathan looks at David and says, you are that man. And when we read the first couple chapters of Hosea and we read about Gomer and we go, oh boy, she was, she was messed up. I'm glad I can learn so much from her. We have those same words echoing, no, you are that prostitute. I am that prostitute. We are the sinner in this story. We all, as I said before, we turn away from God. As humanity, we choose to live in sin. And just like Hosea's heart was broken by Gomer's choices, God's heart is broken when we make decisions that would go against what he would have for us. Yet God decided to save us anyway. He sent his son Jesus to save us from our sin and to offer us a home with him for all eternity. And even though the book of Hosea was written 750 years before Christ, we have time and time again gotten an amazing glimpse of God's persistent love for us. So before we dive into the last chapter, chapter 14 of Hosea, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather and to, to read your word and learn your truth. We thank you for the book of Hosea, even in the hardest moments where we don't understand all of the imagery and we don't necessarily understand the tone. Lord, what we do understand is that you continue to love us and you continue to call us even in the midst of our sin. Thank you for what we can learn. Thank you for what we continue to apply and enrich our lives, this truth that you have for us. Lord, speak through me now. Speak your truth, and let this just be an amazing morning together as a church family. We love you. Amen. All right, let's go back in time a little bit. The year is 2013. I'm on a Mexico missions trip with the church I was working for at the time, and there's, there's a lot of offshoots to this story that, that can create a lot of conversation and, and sermon illustrations. Like, for example, I was the interpreter on this trip. Uh, because just everything about me screams fluent in Spanish with, you know, with, with my quiet North Phoenix upbringing. Uh, but I was the interpreter on this trip. But we're going down uh, to a little town just past Ensenada, and we're going to do some, some missions work, some ministry there. And my boss, I love this man. He's one of my first bosses in ministry. If, if we're going to make a list of all of his strengths, we would run out of paper. We would run out of time. His his calling, his heart, his, his love for people, his love for the Lord. There is one strength that you'll never find on his list. And I'm not going to say his name in case he watches this later. Uh, he'll know that I'm talking about him for sure. There's one strength that you won't find, and that's administrative skills. And that's why I had to be, you know, I was number two on the trip because I'm trying to fill in the details because he just says, we're going to Mexico and we're going to serve. And I go, what on earth does that look like? Maybe we need vans. Maybe we need food. Maybe we need supplies. Maybe we need to tell the kids that we're going on this trip. Yeah, so he's got, he's got this drive, and he loves going, but no administrative skills. And through that, he gives very poor directions. Now, this is 2013, and this is a youth ministry trip. So 
the finance department didn't pay to turn on the international plan on our phones, and there's no good maps. So the phones just stop working once you cross the border. So my boss, he starts giving his version of directions, and his version of directions go like this. When you turn on this particular road, you're going to want to look for a big statue and then turn right. When you then see an avocado stand, you're going to want to turn left. Then you're going to hit a spot where the clouds change colors just a little bit. Keep going straight right there. That's the type of directions that we would get from this guy. And we would, we would try to pay attention. All of us drivers are six vans, and we're just going, this is, just, this is not going to work. But the direction that I remember the most clearly, and it's because it's so bad, it starts like this. If you make it through the border crossing, <laughs> and if you make it through Tijuana, I go, this is just, this is, these are some really big ifs. If you make it through Tijuana, you're going to want to, no matter what, stay on the one. When you get going, no matter what, no matter what, stay on the one. However, if you see signs that point you to the playas, the beaches, remember I'm the interpreter, uh, you're going to want to follow signs to the playas. And I go, okay, just to repeat, no matter what, stay on the one. But if I see signs to the playas, I follow those. He says, yes. And we just start driving. And sure enough, we, we make it through the border. And we make it through Tijuana. But then this happens. All right. We hit a fork in the road. Stay left and you stay on the one. Go right and you're going to the playas. No matter what, stay on the one. But if you see signs of the playas, and that's when all six vans just went nuts. I, I mean, I stayed left. I was in the lead van and all of a sudden vans behind me are going right. I think one van might have just drove right into the center there and just said, this is it. We're not going any farther than this. And we just get lost. And for the next, and it felt like days, but it was probably about 60 to 90 minutes. We're just driving around. I'm turning at every statue that I see. I'm stopping at every avocado stand because they're delicious. And then you, you, you turn and it's like, we, I don't know where we're going. Finally, we just, we, we make it through town. I turn onto this dirt road, and all of a sudden I'm in farm country, and I'm looking down this long dirt road, and I just see through the, through the dust and through the distance, I see this guy, and he is jumping around like crazy, waving his arms. And I'm looking at the, at the rest of the kids and the leaders in my van, and I go, I don't know where we are. I don't know who he is, but he seems to want our attention. So I'm going to drive toward him. And we go and we drive up next to him and, and he's motioning for us to roll down the windows and it turns out that this was the pastor of the church that we were partnering with. He knew, because of our horrific timing, that we were very lost. He knew he needed to come down to the end of the drive and to wave us in and to call us in and to show us the way home. When we read the book of Hosea... And we read about the Israelites and the decisions that they've been making. They are hopelessly lost. They have been given bad directions. They've deliberately gone their own way. And they are just driving around in circles stuck in their sin. But God in his persistent love empowered and spoke through Hosea to call them out on their sin and ultimately show them the way home. We've all had moments where we, too, feel totally lost, whether it's traveling abroad with terrible directions or we're in the midst of hardships in life, in the midst of having to make big decisions that we don't know what to do, or just the general day-to-day -day of whatever life is throwing at us. Sometimes, like the people of Israel, we even get lost in our own success, and we get spiritually complacent. But luckily, once again, we serve an amazing God who calls out to us when we are lost. He sees when we have strayed. He notices when we are confused. His heart breaks when we turn against him. 
But the whole time he is waving his arms, jumping around saying, come home. Let me show you the way. Here's what's also really incredible about our God. There's not a moment that's wasted with him. I love what Pastor Ray spoke on last week, that there are lessons to be learned and growth to be experienced no matter what is going on in our lives. God shapes us in the midst of hardships. He is present even when we flee his presence. And he ultimately wants nothing more than for us to just willingly jump into his loving arms and to spend eternity with him. We see all these things throughout the book of Hosea. Yes, there are moments when, when, when God is, is, is speaking through Hosea and Israel is being told that they're, that they're wicked people, that their leadership is terrible, and their desire to turn against, or excuse me, desire to turn to other countries and other gods is despicable. But there's also a consistent call to turn around and to come back. Hosea is saying, you've wandered pretty far, but there is a way home. And finally, here in chapter 14, Hosea gives the people of Israel one last impassioned plea to return to the Lord. Now, I love this chapter for a lot of reasons, but it's, it's, it's a short and simple last call. There are beautiful word pictures that Hosea gives that are associated with Israel returning to the Lord and giving their hearts to him. There are beautiful parallels for us to draw even over 2,000 years later, especially for anyone who might be here today that is just sick and tired of the struggle and wants to experience a relationship with the Lord, wants to experience something different. So if you're looking at your fill-in-the-blanks, let's get started. Return to God and he will receive us. From verses 1 through 3, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, Take all or take away all iniquity except what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us, we will not ride on horses. We will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you, the orphan finds mercy. So let's walk through verse by verse. Verse 1, return. I don't know about you, but I am always just so refreshed when I see that word in Scripture. And it's a theme all throughout the Bible, and it's a theme in Hosea, return. In fact, if you read through, depending on what version of Hosea you've been reading and studying in, you're going to see the word return over 20 times. You have stumbled because of your iniquity. You have stumbled because of your sin. Now, it is important to note in chapter 14, we see a change of tone. Like I mentioned before, there are some chapters in Hosea where we, we read a pretty harsh, rough tone as Hosea is calling out Israel for their sin. But we see a change in in tone here. And if you look at the word stumbled and how it's used, you've stumbled in your iniquity, you almost kind of think it doesn't do the rest of the book justice. Because if Hosea is using the same tone as he used in previous chapters, he wouldn't use the word stumbled. He would say, he would say, return, O Israel, because you've fallen flat on your face. He would say, return, O Israel, because you stepped in mud, then you slipped and fell in a cow pie, and 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 you, you're just, you're, you're hopelessly lost. But his tone changes here. In fact, the word stumbled is used in a more gentle way. It said, you've tripped, but you're still standing. The Hebrew word kashal, stumble, stagger, totter, almost insinuates that you're, you're starting to trip, but you haven't gone down. I actually enjoy the wording from the message version that says you're down, but you're not out. You've stumbled in your sin. You're down, but you're not out. The beginning of verse 2, when we get into here, it kind of makes me laugh a little bit. We're talking about this stumbling. But then Hosea gives very specific verbiage 
as to how to go and what to say to God. It's kind of the same thing that I say to my kids when they've stepped out of line at home. I got a seven, a five, and a two-year-old, and they, of course, do a lot of things that make me laugh and just the, the, the creativity and the silliness. But then there's also things that that make me frustrated. And my kids know that if they want to frustrate me more than anything, it's to be disrespectful to mommy. If they talk back to her or don't listen, that's going to really frustrate me. So Colton, especially my two-year-old, because he, again, says the funniest things, but he'll also just look you in the eye and say, no. And I don't know where he got that. I mean, it's, it's yeah, not, from, not from me and certainly not from my wife, but he'll just say no. And he'll just turn around and go do his own thing. So as I get over the urge to roll him up and punt him, I, I instead will pull him aside and say, I will give him the words. Say, you need to go to mommy and you need to say, sorry, mommy, for being disrespectful. And he'll go to Brit and he'll say, sorry, mommy, for being be defectful. Like he just makes up his own word. It's, it's a big word. It's a lot, to, a lot to digest there. But I will give him the words and say, go to mommy and say this. Go to mommy and say you're sorry. Hosea, in a very similar way, is giving a real basic script to the Israelites saying, go to God, go to daddy, go to father God and say you're sorry. Go to him and say, take away my sin, take away the bad. Go to him and say, accept what is good. And then he says, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. I had to do a little study on this one because that is not normal verbiage that we use day to day. But Hosea is telling Israel in poetic form here, he's saying, Go make a sacrifice to God in the form of your words. Go make a sacrifice to God in the form of your words. Don't go and make a sacrifice to God because this is what your families have done for generations. Don't go make a, a sacrifice to God because this is just what we do. It's just the practice that we do. Do it because you genuinely want your words to be a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. Do it because you want your words to be a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. Don't go to God for the sake of going through the motions. It's the same thing that we all kind of struggle with from time to time, going to God because it's what we've always done. I know even I'm prone to it even on a Sunday morning, even on, even on a Sunday as a whole. You could look back at the end of the day on Sunday and go, all right, I got it all done. I went to church. I was on time. During the meet and greet, I said hi to people. Yeah. I went to the cafe and I bought a coffee because all proceeds go to missions. Check that box. I even left a tip. I went to home group and I participated in discussion. And we, we just get into this idea. It's like, we're just checking boxes. We're doing it because this is what we do. We're doing it because every week we do this. Hosea is saying to Israel, don't do it because this is what you've always done. In fact, make sac pay, pay with bulls with your lips. Don't just go through those old motions. Actually say the words and mean them. God wants the genuine connection. Sometimes we get caught up in, in the complacency. We get caught up in all the busyness like with Martha. We get caught up in the do, 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 and we forget that actually God is looking for the Mary side. He's looking for that genuine connection. He's looking for us to sit at his feet and spend quality time with him. Say the words that are pleasing to God and mean them. Our next fill in the blank, uh, blank, blank, God does not want our material sacrifices so much as the sacrifices of our lips. I love what Hebrews 13, 15 says here, through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Checking the boxes, or in Israel's case, not checking the boxes, is not the acceptable and pleasing sacrifice. God would much rather have the real and genuine connection and relationship. He wants our adoration, our confession, our thanksgiving, our supplication. 
And through that connection comes the overflow of gratitude. I do it because I want to, not because I have to. Do it because I want to, not because I have to. How often do we get in trouble for doing the right things, but doing it with the wrong heart and the wrong attitude? Husbands, number one way you want to get in trouble at home, do things for your wife with a bad attitude. I can't tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten in trouble for doing things at home, for being helpful, but just to have my wife go, I'd rather you not do it than do it with that attitude. And I said, fine, I won't do it next time. And then you get in trouble for that too. It's a lose-lose. No, we do things because we want to, not because we have to. If we get caught up in just checking the boxes, that is exhausting and it takes us off mission. The last part of this point, verse 3. Say, Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will say no more, our God, to the works of our hands. In you the orphan finds mercy. I love the pictures that are being painted here. This verse is directly correlated with the spiritual complacency that Israel was experiencing. Remember, we've heard throughout this series, Pastor Ray has talked about it, and I know Pastor Mark talked about it as well. Things were going very well for Israel at this time, especially financially. They were in a great place next to Assyria, and they were in this trade route, and they were making lots and lots of money. And because of this, they're becoming complacent. We have all this stuff. We have all this money. Perhaps it's because of us. Perhaps it's because of our trade neighbor and not necessarily because of God. We know even in 2023 that when things are going really well financially, we can get distracted by the gift as opposed to giving credit to the gift giver. We get stuck and we get lost. After all, society says that money equals security. Money equals protection. Money equals more time and stuff for your family. Money equals flexibility. Money even equals happiness. But what if tomorrow you woke up and your bank account was completely empty? Would you panic? Or would you be able to sit back and say, blessed be the name of the Lord, because I find true security in Him, not how much money is in my bank account. So back to the text. Hosea says, We will not ride on horses. We will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. Keep in mind, uh, contextually, if you owned horses, you were either mega rich or you were one of the fiercest warriors at that time. Hosea is saying, Don't ride horses because I don't want you confusing the work of the horse with the work of the Lord. Everything you accomplish is by God's strength, not by horsepower. All right, the three car guys in the room got that. All right, yeah. I had to, I had to look it up. I drive a Corolla. I don't get it. But <laughs> everything you accomplish is by God's strength, not by the power of horses. And the same goes for calling the work of our hands our God. Remember in previous chapters, Hosea goes after the Israelites for making precious little idols out of silver and gold and other precious metals. And he says, stop worshiping them. The statue that's made out of silver is not your God. The creator of the silver is your God. The creator of the universe, the creator of you and me, he is is God. No work of your hands is God. And lastly, he says, in you the orphan finds mercy. Now this picture strikes our hearts no matter what time, no matter what culture we're talking about, whether it's Israel in the time of Hosea or America now. Orphans have it hard at every turn. Even here, our adoption policies are broken. Our foster care system is overwhelmed. And in the time of Hosea, orphans are fighting for survival on the streets. 
every single day is a war and you're begging, you're borrowing, and most likely stealing to survive. Most would die of sickness and starvation. So for Hosea to say that even the orphans, the very least, they find mercy, that speaks to us. That speaks to how receptive God is when we return to Him. Let's look at our next point. When we return to God, He will restore us. He will restore us. And we learn this through verse 4. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely for my anger has turned from them. We're now seeing God's response to the prayers of repentance. Apostasy, the abandonment of religious beliefs. I will heal them for completely turning their backs on me. I will love them freely. This statement here, I, I believe it was the hardest for the Israelites to actually believe. And I say that because I believe it's the hardest because it's the hardest for us to believe. In our culture, I will love them freely. We live in a world that says, if you wrong me, we're done. If you turn your back on me, cool, we're done. I'm going to turn my back on you. It says, if you say something that goes against my political beliefs, you say something that goes against my religious beliefs, we're done. Our relationship is over. You are canceled. That's a fun word. I'm grateful that our God does not take the same approach. He doesn't take that same cancel approach. If he took that same cancel approach, then the Bible would end somewhere around Genesis chapter 3. Am I right? We would get through those first couple chapters. God, he creates, and at every turn, he saw that it was good. He saw that it was very good. And then all of a sudden, humanity turns and sins. <gasps> Roll credits, I'm done with you. Like, no, it would be a very easy read, but it, it wouldn't tell the whole story. It's too short. I will love them freely. God isn't in the cancel business. He is in the restoration business. And you need to know that, and you need to hear that. Look at these next blanks. God does not want to just embrace us. He wants to heal our wounds and love us with no strings attached. God says that even though you have turned your back on me, I am still ready to restore you if you come to me with a repentant heart. And I think there's at least one person in the room today that needs to hear that. I think there's at least one person in the room that needs to know that. I believe there's one person that is sitting here going, Jace, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand what I've been involved with. You don't understand the people that I've been around. God is not here to forgive me. I'm too far gone. And I'm telling you, you are not too far gone. There is forgiveness, there is mercy, and there is restoration that comes for each and every one of us. And then there are no strings attached to his love. If you think you're too far gone and you jump into his arms, he's not going to hold you tight and say, I love you, but <laughs> you are messed up. Like It's just there are no strings there. No strings attached, like there are so often strings attached to our love. We forget, we forget all the time that we are called to restore our relationships with each other, just like Paul instructs us in Galatians 6. We forget that it is the devil's goal to steal, to kill, and to destroy, including our relationships. But it was the goal of Jesus to bring life and to bring restoration, including our relationships. When God says he wants to heal us and love us freely, he means it, no matter what you've done. The truth is we all fall short. If you're sitting there going, you don't know what I've done, look at your neighbor. They've done it too. We all fall short. The wages for our sin is death, but the gift of God, the restoration of God includes eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is such a beautiful thing. Our last point today, when we return to God, he will revive us. And in verses five through eight, Hosea, he can't resist just one last opportunity to, to go through some poetry. 
and, and to create just these beautiful word pictures that we've seen all throughout the book. And these, and these verses, and, and I, I was thinking about reading them, but I knew I couldn't read as good as Pastor Mark did a couple weeks ago and brought the lights down and started reading poetry. I knew I couldn't do that, but I just, I just, took, I just took a few minutes and just noted some of the imagery. When we return to God, he revives us like dew to Israel. We blossom like the lily. We have roots like Lebanon's trees. We flourish like grain. We blossom like the vine. There is fame like the wine of Lebanon. There is beauty like the olive and fragrance like Lebanon. I learned a lot about Lebanon through this. It's, it's, it's on my bucket list now to go visit because it smells great and there's a lot of great trees. Uh, <laughs> but we learn a lot about Lebanon here. No, But some of you, when you read these verses and, and the, just the type of, of brain that you're operating with and, and you, you, you read and you, you get these visuals and all of a sudden you just are taken to this, to this lush, beautiful garden and you, you smell the flowers and, and you smell the, just the, the, the beauty beauty that's all around you. It's like this, this landscape that is covered around you. The very thought of it just relaxes you. Now, there's probably a few others of you like me in the room that you're reading this and you're like, what on earth is Hosea talking about here? I, I read these things and I actually tried them on my wife this last week. She's sitting on the couch and she's working and I know when she's working, you know, don't, don't bug her, she's working. But I go and I sit next to her, I kind of snuggle up close, I run my hand through her hair, I lean in close and I say, you smell like Lebanon. <laughs> she just starts laughing at me. She didn't, she didn't get it. And I go, no, 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 you smell like Lebanon. And, and she just keeps laughing and, and, I, and I'm starting to get embarrassed so I'm walking out of the room and I'm like, you're beautiful like an olive. And, and she didn't get that either. And, and it's like, well, Jose had it figured out when... He's talking about revival, and I, I didn't quite get it when I was talking to my wife. And so certainly one of the times when we need to look at these things contextually, look at what's being written here, what Hosea is writing would certainly, most certainly, capture the hearts and attention and the senses of the Israelite people because he is describing lush, beautiful, and expensive things to them. That's what it's like to come back into the arms of God. It's like being surrounded by all these lush and beautiful things. This is what he provides. He's saying God doesn't want to just receive us. He doesn't want to just restore us. He wants to revive us. And so often we fall into the arms of God with our hurts, our habits, and our hang-ups. We fall into the arms of God because we're in pain. We're feeling lost. We're feeling confused. We're feeling hurt. He doesn't just catch us, slap a Band-Aid on us, and send us on our way. No, he wants to heal us and rebuild us from the inside out. He wants us to be completely changed by our time spent with him. And when we spend time with God, we want that change to be noticed by others. We want that revival to be noticed by others. We want people to see how we live our lives and say there's something different about you, as if there's a, a sweet smell that's coming off of us because of how Jesus has changed us, and it captures the hearts and senses of people around us. That leads us to our next blank. What do you want your life to smell like? I know that's got a lot of you know, deep answers. There are a lot of loaded answers. In fact, turn to your neighbor right now and say, you smell bad. <laughs> Did anyone actually do it? All right. <laughs> that was, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Nope, nope. Not looking. All right. Seriously, though, odors aside, <laughs> body odors aside, does your life put off an aroma that says, I've been completely changed by Jesus? Do people want to be around you because of the joy and the hope and the change that he has produced in you? Uh, the neighborhood that I live in, uh, it's, it's a great neighborhood, lots of good families, lots of very active people. Uh, we see people out every day walking their dogs and hanging out. And in our neighborhood, there's, there's one particular old guy, his, he's in his 70s, his name's Sid. And every day, a couple times a day, he goes out and walks his little mutt uh, named Cheese. 
Uh, can't make that up. Yeah, his name's Cheese. And we'll see him a lot because we'll go out and we're, we're uh, you know, hanging out with the kids and walking our dogs and playing at the park. But I remember not long after we met Sid and Cheese, uh, <laughs> Sid comes up and he, and he just kind of randomly says, Jace, you and your family, are you guys Christians? And in today's culture, that can be kind of a loaded question. I go, who wants to know? <laughs> and he just said, you, you have such a beautiful family, and, and I, I see how you act and interact, and it just made me think that maybe, maybe you have Jesus in your lives, and maybe you have a faith in your lives. And, and, and I was so touched by that and so moved by that, and now every time we see him, he goes, you just have a beautiful family. And, and I don't tell you this story to brag, uh, in fact, it's probably the only time anyone's ever noticed it with me, but uh, I don't say that to brag, but I say that to just illustrate what does it look like when Jesus has just radically changed you so much, what does the outside of your life then look like? How do your interactions look? Do people notice? Our final thoughts from the final verse final chapter of Hosea. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Our last blanks, what type of sinner do you want to be? A stumbling sinner or a forgiven sinner? If you read the, the paragraphs in your bulletin leading up to the notes today, you'll see that we kind of have some options here in 2023 when it comes to studying the book of Hosea. We can either take on the role of spectator and just, again, we're reading and going, oh, Gomer's messed up. Oh, the Israelites are messed up. Thankfully, God was there for them then, and he's calling them to return. And we can just kind of just watch and we can be very passive about it. And when that happens, you know, that old adage, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We can take on that passive watching spectator mode or we can go into the role of proactive learner and we can make the conscious effort to learn from the mistakes that Hosea is so vehemently writing against and we can avoid the same stumbling blocks that they experienced. Do we want to just stumble around in this life or do we want to fall willingly into the arms of our Lord and Savior? Do we want to be received by him, restored by him, and revived by him? Church, there is no doubt that when we read through the book of Hosea, it is a hard read. You can ask Pastor Ray, Pastor Mark, you can ask Russ, you can ask me. It's a hard book to read through and unpack and figure out each week how do we present this in a cohesive way. The poetry, the tone, the imagery, the lesson that God first needed to teach Hosea before he could then pass on a word to Israel, it's, it's difficult. But as we have learned chapter by chapter, verse by verse, it's all meant to show us that nothing can stop God's persistent love for us. And chapter 14 of Hosea shows us that there is nothing sweeter than being received by God, restored by God, and revived by God no matter what is going on in our lives. And I want you to know that no matter how far you've wandered, Jesus provides the way home for you. And if you came to this church today and you're hurting and you're in need of that restoration, you're in need of healing, then I will be here right after this service. I'll be here with any leaders. I'll be here with any elders, any pastors that want to talk and pray for you. If you came in here and you just feel like you are stuck in your sin and you are just covered in shame and you're looking for something different, then maybe today is the day that you come forward. Maybe today is the day that you give your life to the Lord and feel that love, feel that revival, feel that restoration that comes by giving your life to him. I'll be here, so many others, right after I'm done praying. Next week again, we start our new series entitled Worship the King as we march toward Christmas. Hopefully you join us over the month of December and beyond. That'd be fun too. So let's pray. Lord, thank you 
for today. Thank you for the book of Hosea and everything that we've learned. Thank you for what we learn even in chapter 14, this final call to return to you. Lord, no matter where we are at in our walk with you, whether we are uh, new, whether we have been coming to church for years and years, these are words that we can hear and we can hold on to and we can learn from. Lord, no matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what decisions we've made, you are calling us back to you, showing us the way home. Lord, if there is anyone in here that is just feeling stuck in their hurt and they need to give their life, their heart to you, let today be the day. Lord, we love you and we just appreciate that no matter what, no matter when these words were written, even the words of Hosea written 2,700 years ago, we can learn so much. You're an amazing God, and you've blessed us so much throughout this whole series. We love you. Amen.